that is true. And now, we hope that we can still have more learnings because our next speaker is right here. Our third speaker is a current instructor and supervising teacher at the USD College of Education. She graduated from the University of Santo Tomas in 2003 and worked as a New York State Certified Special Education Teacher of Preschool Children with Special Needs. She's also a member of Association for Childhood Education International and National Association for the Education of Young Children and Autism Society of the Philippines, to name a few. Let's give a round of applause for Ms. Ms. Eleanor Bamari Hesari. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Pardon my voice. It, I know it sounds really bad. I don't really normally sound like this. Okay, so um, that video before my talk was really very striking to me. Um, as you all heard, I'm a special educator. I'm a proud special education teacher. Um, I've always been a teacher. I've always wanted to be a teacher. I never wanted to become anything else. As a little girl, whenever I was asked, what did I want to be? I always said I wanted to be a teacher. My dad's a medical doctor. My mom's a teacher. My grandfather is a teacher. And I think that is what led me and impacted my decision to become one. But I want to start right now with asking this question to everyone. How far would you go to step out of your comfort zone? In 2009, I moved half away across the world. I lived a, quite a comfortable life. I've been teaching since I graduated in 2003. Uh, I had experience teaching in different schools. I was already teaching in USD. I help assisted in opening the special education program in the university. I was getting there. I finished a master's degree in special ed and I was very comfortable. But I was too comfortable that it made me feel unsettled. I felt so uneasy. There was just something about the comfort that made me feel uncomfortable. And so, I decided to move to the US. I applied in a graduate school program in New York City. Fortunately, I got accepted. And the next step was to move. But I didn't know if I was ready because I was comfortable. And so I thought to myself, I'm never gonna be ready if I just wait. So I did it anyway. It was one of the toughest decisions I had to make. It wasn't easy simply because there were just so many things at stake. I had to start from nothing. Even with my master's degree in the Philippines, with my position as an instructor in a university, when I got to the US, I was a grad school student. I couldn't find a job because I wasn't certified yet. For two years, I kept looking for a job, whatever I could get, babysitting maybe, you know, anything that I had to do with kids, I was willing to do, but I couldn't get a job. And so it dawned on me, I'm like, what is wrong with me? Like, is this a wrong move? Did I? make a decision too drastically? Did I not think this through? And then I started to doubt myself. I started to question everything that I was doing. I love this saying, when the going gets tough, the tough gets going. Because that was the toughest point in my life. That was my lowest point. You know how like sometimes you think what you have is enough, you think what you are is enough, but then when you get somewhere else, it's like, sorry, you're just not good enough. Sorry, you're not who we want. Sorry, we want someone better. And I've had a lot of doors shut down, shut it down at my face. And that made me think, who am I really? What was the purpose of me coming to this place, to this country where no one knew me? A country where I knew I could reinvent myself because that's what I wanted. But I didn't want to go through 
the struggles like this. I didn't expect the struggles to be that way. And so it made me think, why am I here? What made me decide to come? And I remember this one instance right after my sen I sent my application to the graduate school. I prayed I'd get in. But in my prayer, I said, if I get accepted, I'm going to come back to the Philippines. And I'm going to make sure that the children and families in this country who cannot afford early childhood and special education will be able to get the services. And that's what got me going. I was a proud Filipino. I am a proud Filipino. I may not look Filipino to you. My last name does not sound Filipino. But I identify myself as Filipino. Every paper I wrote in the graduate school, every report I presented, I made sure I said something about the Philippines. I made sure I talked about how public school teachers in this country sacrifice a lot just so that all the kids in their classrooms learn every day. How there are more than 50 students in every public school classroom, but the teachers go to that class every day to teach. How much resources public school teachers in this country pull out of their pockets to make sure that their students have the materials and even have the food to eat, since not all their students can eat three times a day. I was speaking not just for myself, but I was speaking as a Filipino, as a woman, and as a teacher. Why do I do what I do? During my year of internship in the US, my advisor sat me down and asked me, where do you see yourself teaching after you graduate? And I said, I wanted to teach in an infant, toddler, children classroom of children with special needs. I even told her, no kid above eight years old. Because my degree was early childhood. So no kid above eight years old. And she put me in a nonprofit organization that had a therapeutic nursery school in Harlem in New York City. I had my internship there for five months and it was the best time of my life. I worked with the most dedicated special education teachers, social workers, therapists, and administrators. In my last week of internship, the educational director called me into her office. And she said, are you looking for a job? And I said, I've been looking for a job for two years. I don't have a job yet. And she told me, that she's been observing me every single day in the classroom and she wanted to hire me. And obviously, I was over the moon. All she said was, consider it done. I was like, what does that mean? What does that mean when she says, consider it done? And then she said, okay, you know, you can go. I was like, what does that mean? Do I have a job? Do I, am I in, am I not in, what's happening? But that was the shortest and best job interview I've ever had. Because <laughs> she just asked me, do you need a job? I said, yes. She said, consider it done. And that was it. I taught in that school for two and a half years. It was the best experience I've ever had. I worked with diverse families from the Harlem neighborhood and all around New York City. I worked with children and families who were living in poverty. And that was my favorite population to work with. Those kids who needed teachers the most. But when things were just getting better, so I thought, all of a sudden, that unsettling feeling I felt in 2009, I started to feel it again. I'm like, how can I feel this? I'm enjoying, I'm having fun. This is my dream job, my dream school, what's happening? I felt unsettled. Then I started to think of what I said when I prayed to get what I wanted. And that unsettling feeling led me to pack up my apartment, sell my stuff, sell my boxes of books, and move back to the Philippines. 
I lived in New York for four and a half years, studying and teaching. But when I felt unsettled, I knew it was time for me to come back home. Right now, now that I'm here, I try to find and surround myself with people that inspire me and people that actually can partner with me in that journey. And one of my inspirations is, of course, I'm sure everyone knows her. Malala Yousafzai, a Pakistani female education activist. She's young, she's passionate, she's driven, she's a visionary. She is my icon. I look up to her and I support her organizations. Three most important women in my life, one of them is here. My mom and two of my aunts who helped raise me. These are the powerful women who I looked up to every, ever since I was young. Intelligent, independent, and they taught me to fend for myself. You find your picture there if you're my student, say something or scream or whatever. But I find inspiration and I journey with my university students because every day they challenge me and they teach me that fighting for the rights of children with disabilities in this country is one of the most important things we can do. I find inspiration in the organizations that I support. I find inspiration in the colleagues that I work with. And I find inspiration in the children and families I have worked with and children and families that I will be working with in the future. So I want you to ask yourself, when you're faced in different situations and you have to make a decision, how do you define yourself? Who are you? In the core of your being, who are you? Every time I'm asked that question, I only have three answers. One is, I'm a teacher. I chose to be a teacher. That's my chosen vocation, and I'm going to die as a teacher. Second is, I am Filipino. I choose to identify myself as Filipino. I'm proud to be Filipino. Even if I've had options to choose not to be one, I still chose to be one. And I'm a woman. I am I'm empowered by the women I work with. I am empowered by the women who brought me up. I am empowered by the women I encounter every day. And I am, I am empowered by the men who respect women for who they are. So I want to end with this. At the end of the day, whatever decision I made in my life, whether it was right or wrong, whether it was wise or unwise, it led me to where I am. And that is my wavelength, and that has made all the difference. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miss 